So I just passed 60,000 subscribers here on YouTube, which is awesome. Um, to celebrate that, I'm gonna do a Q&A video now, where I will answer many of your questions that you have asked me on Instagram and uh, on the YouTube community tab, when I asked you to ask me questions a couple of days ago. So yeah, I'm just gonna answer questions and that's about it. It will be about photography in general, it will be about macro photography of course, and also about other things such as life. So let's go. What software can you use besides Photoshop to focus stack? And in my last stacking video, I used Photoshop and I was really excited because it is actually very easy to do a nice handheld focus stack in Photoshop. Uh, at least if you only have like a few photos, like two to five photos, I think Photoshop is excellent as a tool to focus stack. But I do think that if you have many photos, like a hundred or something, it could actually be easier in other tools. And the two dominating focus stacking softwares are Serene Stacker and Helicon Focus. And both of these have like a similar set of features and I think they are pretty similar in pricing as well. Uh, my personal favorite is Helicon because I just find it more intuitive and I get better results with it. Uh, but that's just me. But those are the two that you can look into besides Photoshop. How big is the difference in depth of field in macro photography between full frame and APS-C? And basically, yes, there is a difference uh, if you're not doing high magnification macro photography, then of course you get a deeper depth of field, the smaller the sensor is. I'm not sure exactly how big the difference is. It's kind of hard to express in words uh, because it depends a bit on how far away you are from the subject and uh, so on. But I will say this, that uh, when you're doing high magnification macro photography, like one to two or three times magnification, it actually doesn't matter that much with the sensor size because you will get, uh, you will be uh, limited by the um, diffraction anyway. And uh, if you look at the diffraction in combination with the aperture and in combination with the sensor size, you will actually discover that at high magnifications, you don't win anything by having a smaller sensor. You will have the same depth of field anyway um, when you try to use the smallest aperture possible without getting diffraction, if that makes sense. Uh, so basically, if you're doing high magnification macro photography, sensor size doesn't matter that much. The only thing you need to know is that a bigger sensor will give you a higher dynamic range and you will be able to capture more color information basically with a bigger sensor. So that is why I kind of prefer full frame still for macro photography. Honest opinion, is it worth selling macro photos as NFTs? I'm kind of torn on that. Uh, for me, it has been worth it so far. Uh, I sold 17 NFTs uh, to this day and it made me quite a bit of money in one month, like almost more money than I make from YouTube. So I'm definitely gonna continue selling NFTs and exploring that space. And also I think it is a great investment in the future to start selling NFTs now, because even if you don't make that mon much money right now, this market will grow and grow and grow as more users uh, come into it and more collectors come into it. So I think in a few years from now, uh, you will definitely be able to earn some serious money with NFTs, uh, even if you are a smaller photographer. That is my hunch, at least. Of course, I cannot look into the future, but that is my guess. Um, but then, on the other hand, I have a pretty big platform. I have 60,000 subscribers on YouTube. I have like 16,000 uh, on Instagram and so on. Uh, so I have uh, quite a lot of reach, more reach than maybe most people. Uh, so. If you don't have tens of thousands of followers, it might be hard to get into the NFT space and to actually sell NFTs. Uh, let's be honest about that. On the other hand, right now, as the collector communities in NFTs is so very small, it's such a tiny click of people, it actually doesn't matter too much how big audience you have, because what matters is how many of the collectors know about you. And they are such a small click of people, so 
the best and most efficient way to actually get them to know about you is to network and to be active on NFT Twitter and so on. Uh, so that is why a lot of very big Instagram influencers who have maybe hundreds of thousands of followers are actually not doing that great in the NFT space because they just assume that their big audience would sell them, would, would buy their NFTs, but they don't understand that it's only like one of maybe 10,000 people who is actually an NFT, NFT collector so far. So their big audience doesn't do that much good. They have to mingle and network and hang out with a small clique of people who are actually active NFT collectors. Uh, I think that will change in the upcoming years as the NFT market grows and grows and grows. But right now, uh, I think you just need to be active on like Twitter and in the NFT discords uh, to get to know people who will then buy your NFTs. Have you ever thought about using focal lengths longer than 100 mm for butterfly or dragonfly photography? Yes, definitely. Although I don't do that much butterfly or dragonfly photography. I've done it once or twice, but it's not my main thing. But definitely, if you're gonna shoot these uh, animals, you need to have a pretty long working distance because it's, it's very hard to approach them um, without them flying away, especially dragonflies. So yeah, definitely look into buying maybe a Sigma 150 millimeter. That's a great lens for this kind of photography. Uh, and this is actually the exception to my personal rule that working distance doesn't matter in macro photography. Most of the time, I think it doesn't matter, but for certain insects like butterflies, for example, it actually does matter quite a bit. Have you ever tried non-macro nature photography like landscape, wildlife or astrophotography? I certainly have. In the beginning, when I was new in photography, like five or six years ago, I tried many different genres. I tried basically all genres you can think of uh, because I was excited to explore different genres and to try to discover what my main passion would be. And it actually took maybe one or two years until I found out that macro photography is probably the kind of photography that, that I love the most. But before that I did lots of different kinds of photography and it was a lot of fun. And even today I'm sometimes doing other kinds of photography like landscape or wildlife or portraits. If money was no issue, what camera and lens would I get and what would I shoot? Yeah, I guess I would continue shooting the same things that I'm doing now, mostly macro photography and some portraits. Uh, the most interesting cameras on the market right now that I would look into buying if money was no issue would be the, the Canon uh, R5. I held one uh, recently and I love the ergonomics. It's so much better than Sony and it's an awesome camera in general. Um, also the Sony A1 of course. It's a beast of a camera and uh, I think it would either be the Sony A1 or the Canon R5 that I would pick up if I could pick any camera. And then I would uh, probably go with uh, the same lens that I'm using right now, the Laowa 60mm or possibly the Laowa 100mm as the lens because I love doing macro photography and those are great lenses. What inspired you to be a photographer? I think for me it probably began with Instagram. That is where I discovered that it's fun to take photos and to apply filters on them and try to make them look nice. Uh, that was back in like 2012 or something. And actually short, shortly after I started using Instagram, I think I bought my first uh, camera, like real um, serious camera. It was like a micro four thirds camera. And I did some experiments. I was traveling in Japan for the first time and I did some long exposure experiments. And that is kind of where my first um, like small seed of passion for photography was born. That was a lot of fun. But then uh, I did many other things and kind of forgot about photography for many years until 2015, 2016, uh, when I met my wife and uh, I find her so beautiful and I found her so beautiful that I 
just wanted to take many photos of her and that is how I kind of got back into photography to take photos of her and from there I just fell down the rabbit hole and got so so very interested and passionate about cameras and photography and then later macro photography. What got you into macro photography? That is um, one day a few years ago when I was browsing YouTube for interesting photography videos and I stumbled upon Thomas Shahan's videos. I think most of you have probably seen them. If not, you should definitely uh, search Thomas Shahan on YouTube and look at his videos. He is uh, such a talented macro photographer and I love how his photos look and when I saw his videos for the first time, the day after I bought my first macro lens because I was so excited about what you can do uh, with macro photography and I still am. Uh, so thank you Thomas, Thomas Shahan for inspiring me to start macro photography. Actually many of the things I teach on this channel is things that I learned from Thomas Shahan. So I'm mostly just reiterating what he's teaching. Uh, so that is really... Uh, the main uh, inspiration for me to start with macro photography and also how I do my macro photography. And actually this uh, sweatshirt right here is made by Thomas Shehan, at least the, the, the woodcut here. I think it's beautiful. Uh, so that is <laughs> one way I decided to thank him by buying this uh, sweatshirt. And also because I love how it looks. Do you like caviar paste? <laughs> this was asked by Matthew Stern. Uh, caviar is this uh, weird fish egg uh, paste that we eat in Sweden. I'm not sure if it's actually a thing in any other country, maybe in some other Nordic countries. Tastes pretty special and I, I like it personally. Uh, even though I tend to eat the, the version that is striped and mixed with cream cheese to have a bit of a milder taste. Uh, but I like the taste of it, um, but I think I would probably hate it uh, if I wouldn't have grown up with it. I can totally understand people from other cultures and countries who think it's uh, awful. <laughs> I, I completely get that. Is ring flash a good option to use for macro photography? Um, I did a video about this recently, uh, why I don't like ring flashes. Um, it's the video about the Godox MF12 and there I talk a little bit more about why I don't like them. Uh, in some cases um, if you want just good light and you don't need the photo to be beautiful it can be a very good option maybe if you're a dentist uh, for example but if your goal is to make beautiful photos that look good I don't think ring flashes are a good option. What is the best macro lens for the Sony A6000? Uh, in my opinion, the very best macro lens that you can get for any APS-C mirrorless camera, such as the Sony A6000 or such as the Fujifilm cameras, would be the Lauva 65mm macro lens. This is how it looks. And the reason I think this is the best macro lens for APS-C mirrorless cameras is that it is pretty much perfect optically and it is uh, one of only two lenses for APS-C that goes to two times magnification so you can get very close if you're doing insect macro photography and um, yeah it's very small and compact very lightweight and it's not very expensive either so it's just a very awesome lens for not that much money. And I definitely think you should buy it if you have an APS-C camera, such as the Sony A6000. Are you going to try new diffusion techniques or are you happy with your current setup? Uh, I've been using my current setup for a long time now, you know, this uh, white screen that I put around the lens. And I'm very happy with that. Uh, that's why I've been using it now for a couple of years. But I am going to try some new diffusers uh, next macro season. Uh, for example, I got sent to me uh, the one that's called AK Diffuser. Uh, I haven't unboxed it yet. It is uh, here in the package. Uh, but I'm really excited to try that and to see um, what kind of result it gives. And I would definitely 
make a video about it, but it might not be until next spring because I really want to photograph insects with it, uh, but we'll see. I'll definitely look into some, some other diffusers than the one I use the most. Favorite singers or bands or genres of music? I listen to many different genres of music. I don't really have like a favorite genre, uh, but the ones I listen a bit more to is maybe rap and hip hop, mostly from the 90s. I love that sound and all of those uh, artists. And I also listen uh, quite a bit to electronic music, uh, also like just singer-songwriter music from the 60s, such as Cat Stevens. I love uh, his music. Yeah, it's lots of different genres. Uh, I will link my Spotify account in uh, the description if you're curious. I actually make a list every month uh, of my favorite songs that I listen to that particular month. And I've been doing that uh, every month since Spotify was released back in like 2008 or something. So I have a lot of playlists on there. So you can go check it out. Print photos or keep them digital? I'm actually not like a lot into printing. I do it sometimes, uh, but not very often. I actually prefer honestly to watch photos on a high resolution computer screen. I think uh, actually you get more definition um, when you look at photos on a, a, like a retina screen, like a screen with very high resolution. So I actually prefer to look at both my and other photos on a screen. How weird that might sound. And I think that is one of the reasons I'm so much in love with NFTs, because that is uh, a way of selling photos that you view on a screen. Uh, earlier I've been considering should I do a photo book or should I sell prints, but I have never really felt that that is for me because I prefer viewing photos on a screen and now with NFTs when I can actually sell photos that you view on a screen I'm very excited about that because I think that is more uh, for me. What have you learned from the macro world that is applicable for life in general? Oh that's a deep question. I don't know I think what I've learned is that value of being in the zone, the value of being um, completely into what you're doing, uh, to really be so concentrated on the task you're doing that you forget about everything else. And so that time just passes, you forget to eat, you forget to go to the bathroom, you just like completely focused and you basically shut down all your other thoughts. Uh, it's kind of like the purest form of meditation. And I very easily get into that zone when I'm doing macro photography. There are some other ways, of course, uh, that people get into that zone or like many other ways. Earlier in life, I could get into that zone when I was doing other kinds of creative tasks, such as programming or yeah, making art on the computer uh, in different forms. Uh, but with macro photography, I've kind of relearned how nice a feeling it is to be in the zone when you're doing something creative and how uh, valuable that is to just be happy in life in general and to feel good. Uh, I guess that is my answer to the question what I've learned from macro photography that I can apply to life in general. The importance of shutting all, down all thoughts and being in the zone now and then. Affordable recommended flash for macro photography. Yeah, as I always say, you can use pretty much any flash for macro photography. It doesn't matter if it's cheap or expensive, like most of them do the job well. Uh, one flash that I often recommend is the Mikey MK320 because it's very cheap and it's awesome and it's small and compact. I made a video about that flash, go check it out. Best macro lens for beginners on a budget. I think I would recommend, there are a couple of macro lenses that are very cheap and very good. The one I would recommend like in general if you are on a budget and a beginner is the Mikey 85mm macro lens that goes to one and a half times magnification. I made a video about that lens, it is a very good value for your money and it's very cheap so go check it out. Best video game from the 90s. 
I really love the LucasArts adventure games. I played those a lot in the 90s and I still play them. I like replay many of those games right now. I'm actually playing Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. And when it was in the 90s, I was basically a kid then, so I wasn't really smart enough to beat all those games, but now I am, so now I replay them and try to beat them, and it's a lot of fun. I love those games. Some other good ones uh, are like Day of the Tentacle, uh, Grim Fandango, uh, Sam and Max Hit the Road. Uh, the stories in those games and the graphics and uh, the general vibe is so amazing and I really love them and uh, I look forward to playing through some more of them uh, from beginning to end uh, and also the ones I missed that I didn't play in the 90s I plan to play them again. How does being a full-time YouTuber feel? Isn't it a bit scary? No, I don't think it is scary at all. Even though you never know how much money you're gonna make next month or in a year from now. Like this, that is very uncertain, but I don't feel scared. I feel pretty confident that I will be able to make enough money to continue doing this for a living. Uh, this year I'm actually not having that much time to do my macro photography or my YouTube videos because uh, I have two small children of which one is still at home. Uh, so uh, that takes a lot of time. Next year in the spring my youngest will start kindergarten or preschool and then I will have a lot more time and then I should be able to produce more videos and make more money. Uh, so hopefully that will work out great. But in general it feels awesome to be a full-time youtuber i love this this is the most thing fun thing i've ever done and i still feel that and yeah i just love every minute of being a youtuber so i'm actually very very grateful that i can do this and i really hope that i will be able to continue doing it and that i will continue to enjoy it are you still shooting with a reversed lens not every day, not most of the time, but sometimes I do. I love to always rotate my equipment and to use different cameras and different lenses all the time. And uh, reverse lenses is something I use now and then for fun. So um, yeah, I still shoot with a reverse lens now and then. Are you planning to do any Lightroom editing tutorial videos? Uh, I did a few of those earlier. Uh, Usually they aren't like super super popular, uh, they get views but not as many views as some other types of videos so that's why I'm not doing like too many of these and also I feel like I have my editing style that I use all the time and it doesn't change that much so whenever I do a new Lightroom editing video I feel like I'm just repeating myself uh, but uh, so that's why I don't do too many of them like I, I always try to make uh, videos about new things to, to teach you guys new things uh, and show you guys new things. Uh, so I, I, I try to repeat myself as little as possible but please uh, leave a comment if you want to see more Lightroom videos and if you have any certain kind of Lightroom editing tips that you want to see let me know and I will look into it. Did you find any good alternatives to Instagram? I looked for a bit, I tried Flickr for a while but didn't really stick with me. I downloaded this new app that you pay for called Glass and I like some of the ideas in that app for example that it's very focused on the photos itself and uh, you barely even see who's behind the photo unless you check. I love that idea and concept that makes you uh, more focused on actually enjoying someone's photos. But the app is too boring, like without, without the likes or like a good explore function that I still think they don't really have. It's hard to find good photographers and you don't get a reminder to check the app every day because you're not looking to see if you got any new likes. So actually I have forgotten to check the app for like one or two weeks at a time and it's just not engaging enough. Uh, so I think that's their main problem that they went too far in the other direction from Instagram. Uh, so no, I still think Instagram is kind of the main app. 
even though I've been using Twitter a lot more uh, for photography uh, since I started for discovering NFTs because Twitter is like the main platform that NFT people hang out at. So I've started to use Twitter a lot more and I still think Instagram is probably the best app for sharing photos at the moment. Favorite football club? I have to disappoint you guys, I'm not into sports at all. I'm extremely uninterested in sports and in football. Um, I don't have any team that I'm rooting for. I usually don't even know when it's like the world championships or anything. I, I usually learn about that after the fact. Uh, so I have to say pass on that question. When are you coming to photograph the peculiarities of Brazil? Love your work, you are an inspiration to me. Um, I would love to travel more. To do more macro photography in other countries. I love Brazil. I've uh, been there once in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, awesome country. And um, yeah, my current situation is basically that I cannot really travel for uh, two reasons. <laughs> the first reason is that I have two small children, of which one is uh, only a few months old. And that makes it a bit harder to travel, but it's not like a deal breaker. But the deal breaker recently has been uh, the pandemic and uh, everything that uh, stops you from travel for that reason. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to more countries opening up and to do some more travel. Uh, one country that me and my wife is really longing to go back to is Japan. I love traveling to Japan and uh, as soon as uh, they allow tourists to come back, I think we will travel there. Uh, but I would really love to go to Central and South America to do some macro photography there. Um, hopefully at some point in the future, but probably not within the next six months. I am curious uh, about if there are no white elements in a photo, how can I adjust the white balance? Well, that's tricky. Uh, the easiest way to get a good white balance is to find the part of the picture that is uh, neutral gray or uh, white and just use the white balance picker on that area to use it for calibration. But if there are no white parts, yeah, you basically have to go by gut feeling. You have to adjust the sliders for white balance yourself until it looks good. And that takes some practice. Um, but yeah, that's how you have to do it. How do you know what to edit in a photo? Good question. <laughs> I think uh, there are two factors here. Uh, first of all, I go on gut feeling. Uh, when I edit and when I pick my photos, I always go on like, how does this photo feel within the first two seconds of looking at it? Does it feel good? Great, then I'm done. <laughs> Is there something that's missing or that doesn't feel good? Then I need to try to edit that or try to adjust that in some way. Or if it's the whole photo that feels not good, then I have to throw it away. That's the first part of good editing, I think, just having a gut feeling. And the second part is developing that gut feeling. And I think that you can only do by looking at a lot of photos both your own and other people's photos and try to think what makes this a good photo or what makes this a bad photo. What is it I like about it and what is it I don't like about it? And is there any way to make the parts I don't like better through editing? And I think once you spend enough time thinking like that and looking at a lot of photos and editing a lot of photos, you develop a good gut feeling over time. And But I think it takes like a few years to get good at it and I'm not saying I am done by any means I think it's something you have to develop over a lifetime but I think you just need a lot of practice and a lot of thinking about what makes a good edit and what makes a good photo. How do you deal with shooting at f8 or higher with a Laowa 60mm lens when it's too dark in the viewfinder to see anything? Well, uh, if you're using a DSLR, I guess you have to um, uh, open up the aperture when you're focusing and then try to close it down when taking a photo, which is kind of hard. But most people use mirrorless cameras nowadays and then there is actually a setting in pretty much every mirrorless camera 
to brighten the viewfinder when you're shooting at small apertures. Uh, I actually made a whole video about macro photography settings. Uh, search my name and macro settings and you will find that video. And there I explain how you can adjust this setting so that the viewfinder looks brighter on a mirrorless camera. And even if you are using a DSLR, you can probably find a similar setting for making the live view brighter. Uh, and that is very important, otherwise it's of course very hard to do macro photography. And I think we will have to end this video here. I haven't gone through all your questions unfortunately, I tried to do as many as possible, but now I feel that this video is getting a bit too long and my voice is starting to <laughs> break up a little. So I think we'll hold it here. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you did like it and if you do like my videos in general, please consider supporting me on Patreon with a small amount each month or subscribing to my newsletter to get more uh, thoughts from me on a monthly basis. Thank you for watching. See you very soon again. Over and out. Bye.